but you can't do that, said one of the critics. That doesn't bother me. Really? Again? Really? Look at that little enemy of God. Somehow we dilly and dally. Takes us years, and we wonder why. What are you waiting for? What a wonderful privilege Zechariah had. And all of a sudden, Gabriel appears. And what a magnificent representation of Gabriel. But after Gabriel tells Zechariah the good news, I just couldn't believe it when he says, How can I be sure of this? Part of me was screaming out, Don't say that. Whatever you do, don't say that. You see, I became emotionally involved with the account. And of course, it helped me to understand why Zechariah had a little bit of a punishment coming to him. See, discipline didn't stunt him. It didn't hurt him. It helped him to grow. How can we use this lesson today? Well, we all know that Jehovah does not use angels to give us counsel. He uses imperfect people. And that can be a real test to us. In the following dramatization, note how an experienced brother reacts when he receives some unexpected counsel. In contrast, King Josiah upheld justice and righteousness. If you open your Bible, in I've been giving public talks for decades. And verses uh, 15 and move it 16. And in all that time, I've never had something like this happen. Thank you. Nice you. Real nice meeting you too. Hope to see you, see you later. Bye. Efrain. Yes. You have a minute? Yes. Wanted to talk to you about something. Okay. Thanks so much for just taking a moment. I uh, just wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, he counseled me about my teaching. I don't want to ignore his words, but the friends in the congregation love my talks. I think. Justice and righteousness. If you open your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 22, chapter 22, verses 15 and 16. I'm just not sure how to feel about all of this. We watch the good news according to Jesus again. This time, I paid special attention to the correction that Zachariah received. I read the account again, and I noticed he was described as being blameless. But that did not mean he was above correction. My brother gave me kind, but direct counsel from God's Word. It's a privilege to teach in a congregation, and I want to give my very best to Jehovah. Do you have a moment? Sure. I wanted to ask you, I'm working on a part for next week. I was hoping you listen to it and let me know what I can work on. Of course. I'll be happy to. I really appreciate it. Hey, by the way, will you and your wife still be able to join us for that gathering next week? Oh, absolutely. We're really looking forward to it. Same here. All right. All right. Good night. Now that was an excellent example of somebody who had a good attitude about the council. We don't want to belittle the discipline as if it didn't have much value or if it didn't apply to us. If we were to do that, we could be turning away from a really nice suggestion and helpful advice from our God, Jehovah. 
We learned a lot from Zechariah's example today. He didn't become bitter from the discipline. He allowed it to help him grow, to build his obedience and his faith, even in his old age. Uh, Yes, older brothers and sisters receive counsel and discipline too, viewing it as love from their heavenly Father. When we're humble, we recognize that our opinion isn't always the right one. What about mildness? Mildness will help us to think about the effect our words might have on our brothers and sisters. We would never want to hurt them, even when we strongly disagree with them. And we should give them the benefit of the doubt. Just because someone disagrees with us doesn't make him a bad person. We have to understand that. And uh, his difference of opinion uh, may, ser- it may search us through. It, it may be something that we need to think about and consider. And we always consider that the other person may be right. The story of Josiah has proven to be yet another example of how Jehovah continues to provide abundant spiritual food and support for his people worldwide. That video certainly brought the Bible account to life for us. You may want to go back and review the full feature film again from our website. We might mention that we've had just a few parents write in expressing concern that some of our videos depict scenes that could have an effect on children who've been protected from anything even hinting at an act of violence. We very much appreciate the concern. However, when portraying a Bible account, we cannot ignore the message Jehovah saw fit to preserve in His Word. We don't feel comfortable watering down the inspired insight that Jehovah has preserved for the benefit of true worshipers. However, as you've observed, we do so as tastefully as possible. We don't show actual violent acts or bloodshed. Parents, likewise, need to give their children a realistic idea of what we all will face in the near future. Many parents choose to help their children appreciate the graphic visual imagery of a Bible-based video, while at the same time building trust in Jehovah who will be with them in times of distress. This is similar to what they do when reading a graphic biblical account to their children from the scriptures, such as from the book of Revelation. Be assured that we'll continue to be sensitive to the feelings of you parents when we produce a video that's based on a Bible account that includes descriptions of warfare or other incidents of violent actions. We'll do so with care, while not ignoring the powerful details depicted in the inspired Word of God. If you recall in the May 2020 JW Broadcasting Monthly Program, Brother Lett addressed the concern a few parents have expressed about some of our videos that depict biblical or modern-day situations. In these, at times, true worshipers are depicted as having their faith tested as if by fire. The concern expressed is that some scenes could have an effect on children who've been protected from all negative circumstances on TV, including daily news reports of catastrophes being faced by real people. The basement scene we just reviewed was one of our videos that produced such a reaction. Another one was the reenactment of the Bible account depicting Jehovah's saving acts in the time of King Hezekiah. It was shown at the 2016 Regional Convention, and the video is entitled, O Jehovah, I Trust in You. Let's look again at that portrayal of Jehovah's saving acts. My, my 
if a parent has shielded his child from viewing all scenes on the news or other visual images depicting negative realities, it's understandable that there may be a concern. However, as Brother Letts stated, parents need to give their children a realistic idea of what we will face in the near future. Many parents choose to help their children appreciate the graphic visual imagery of a Bible-based account, while at the same time building trust in Jehovah, who will be with them in times of distress. The point is, friends, the Bible warns us, young and old alike, that a time of fiery testing looms on the horizon. We want to be realistic and face these events with faith and courage. Our videos depict such circumstances in a tasteful and sanitized way, not showing any actual acts of bloodshed or violence. Be assured that the governing body is not trying to scare anyone. Instead, we are trying to prepare everyone. I'd like to talk about the translation of our publications. And there's a particular aspect of translation I'd like to comment on. Now, I know that uh, quite a number of you have moved to a country where your mother tongue isn't spoken, either to find work or to serve where the need is greater. And others are serving right at home, but in foreign language congregations. At times, you may have compared an article in your mother tongue with the same article in your second language and found differences in the translation. And you might wonder why that is. Well, we'd never conclude that the translators had been unfaithful or careless or that they were running ahead of the organization. No, we trust our hardworking brothers and sisters. So we know there must be good reasons for the differences. And the purpose of this brief discussion is to suggest what some of those reasons might be. First, a word about one of the principles our translators follow. They're expected not only to render the thought in the English text accurately, but also to keep in mind the way people speak. So accuracy, clarity, and naturalness are needed while maintaining the dignity of our message. So you can't always compare the length of an English paragraph with the length of the paragraph in the target language and say, hey, this paragraph is shorter than that paragraph. Sometimes we hear brothers who have learned a second language say, I don't see why the translators didn't follow the English word for word. After all, you can say that in the language. Well, you may have the words. It may be possible to say that. But would a literal translation sound strange to native speakers? No matter how well a foreigner has learned a language, native speakers who speak the language well are usually the best judges of what is natural. Modesty will help foreign speakers to recognize that. There's another thing that foreign speakers need to be aware of. If they're vocal in their criticism of a certain translation, how would that affect the confidence of native speakers who have to rely on the translation for their spiritual food? Of course, nobody's perfect. And as long as translation is done by imperfect people, it won't be perfect. But rest assured that our translators take their work very seriously. Think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? If anybody takes action against someone who would threaten our young ones and takes action to protect our young ones, it's Jehovah's organization. We reject outright such lies. Now, there's uh, something that uh, the apostates are uh, talking about and trying to put forward. The media has picked it up. Others have also picked it up. And that is our scriptural position of having two witnesses a requirement for judicial action if there's no confession. It's very clear, isn't it? You cannot establish a judicial committee based on one witness. But now listen, 
Here's, here's what they say. Well, now look, the Old Testament also says that adulteresses should be stoned. Now, since you're not doing that, why do you stick to this two-witness rule? And see, if you're not careful, that can do some, some tricks on your mind because you have to think it through. Well, how, how might we do that? Well, we'll go to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 16 because obviously uh, Christ Jesus established the Christian arrangement. And notice what he said, Matthew 18 and verse 16. He says, but if he does not listen, take along with you one or two more so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. So Christ Jesus establishes the fact that there has to be two witnesses. Now, it doesn't mean that if, if there's only one witness, that there's no consequences. There might be, depending upon the situation. But the, the scriptures are very clear. Before a judicial committee can be convened, there has to be a confession or two witnesses. So we will never change our scriptural position on that subject. But you can't do that said one of the critics. It doesn't bother me. Really? Again? Really? Look at that little enemy of God. Somehow we dilly and dally. Takes us years and we wonder why. What are you waiting for? 